Thank you all for coming in my and all of our guests. It's very exciting to do this again. I've been editing this anthology for the past three, four years. And one of the great privileges is um, to be able to welcome and talk and introduce and listen to the readings of writers from all over the world. Uh, this is Robert Dahl, he's from Slovakia, with uh, Noel Revalas from Switzerland, and uh, Patrick Bolthauser from Liechtenstein in Switzerland. And uh, the game is this, I will introduce each of them. They will read in their original language. Uh, and then Marty, and, uh, and this is Marty Riker, who works for the Dark Archive Press, the saintly press that publishes translations in this country. Can't quite hear you. Sorry. The microphone. Yes, the microphone. <laughs> um, I mumble, it's not the microphone. So I have to lean into it. Anyway, this is Marty Riker, who works for the Dark Archive Press. He and I will read the English translations of our guest's work. So, without further ado, Robert Gall. He was born in Bratislava, Slovakia. He lived uh, all over. He lived in uh, New York and used to attend for a year, I believe, this very school, the new school. He lived in uh, uh, Jerusalem and Berlin, and now he lives in Prague. He has written several books of philosophical aphorisms, <laughs> which I will ask him about, and two novels, On Wing from 2006 and Agnomia from 2008 an excerpt from which is in this year's, this year's anthology. Both of his novels are forthcoming in English. So, Robert Dahl. Thank you for introducing me, Mr. Hamon, and thank you for being here. Uh, yes, it's true that I studied here, but it was 20 years ago, and my English in that time was, was zero. So now it's a little bit more than zero, so, <laughs> so I will start uh, to read uh, one excerpt from my story, Agnomia in Slovak. Áno, všetci chceme byť tak strašne pochopení a pritom dobre vieme, že niektoré veci, ktoré sa pokúšame chápať, sú jednoducho nepochopiteľné a to priamo zo svojej podstaty. Prečo vlastne tak úporne hľadáme zámky v každých, teda aj v otvorených dverách? Aj to je jedna z otázok týkajúcich sa Buňuela a jeho aniela skazy. Nemôže skutočnosť zámku na otvorených dverách pozmeniť status ich otvorenosti a podobne. Tvoriť kultúru znamená vo väčšine prípadov byť nutne a kultúrny. Lebo na čo potrebuje tvorca na to, čo tvorí, poznať to, čo tvorí niekto iný. Tvorcovi stačí široko rozsiahle tápanie, on totiž dobre vie, že nejaké tápanie, ani to najširoko rozsiahlejšie, nemôže byť bezbrehé, lebo potom by sa prelialo do niečoho iného. Úlohou tvorcu je uchovať prelievajúce sa vo vlastnej povahe toho, čím je to, a pritom dokázať zabrániť, aby sa naozaj prelialo do niečoho iného. Ide tu teda o permanentné udržiavanie toku chceného, ktoré sa z tohto dôvodu bezpodmienečne stáva mysleným. Mysleným v zmysle tautológie, teda neoddiskutovateľným, mysleným v zmysle realizácie aktu myšlienky, ktorej kontextom je tok mysleného neustále pretavovaný v tok myslenia. I'll be reading uh, the English translation of the passage. There is a name in it that I cannot pronounce. <laughs> Step in there. Your passage is a little bit longer. Yes, the passage I'll be reading is a little bit longer. Um, 
Ten by proper prep. And it starts a few, few sentences after. <laughs> in fact, they're not even related. <laughs> To create a culture necessarily means, in most cases, to be acultural. For why should a creator need to know what others create for the purposes of his own creation? A widespread and blind groping about is sufficient for a creator, since he knows very well that no groping can be without limits or else it would spill into something else. The role of the creator is to sustain the spill within one's own character, preventing it from ever spilling into something else. As such, we're dealing with the permanent maintenance of the desired flow, which for this reason becomes a flow of thought in the sense of a tautology. That is indisputable. A flow of thought in the sense of a realization of the act of thought. The flow of what's being thought continually melting into the flow of thinking. This isn't philosophy, just the gradual process of a creative undertaking with a jackhammer in hand. A creator is always more of a worker than an intellectual. A man forced to observe is learning to observe. A circle inside a circle, repeatedly burst like a bubble. The lure of traps, traps that even traps fall into. I say only people who are perverse in their body and soul can perform great deeds, claims Frantisek Dertikol in one of his letters, adding, but it must be a pure, beautiful, original, free-spirited perversion, bubbling up from the man's own depth. It may not be a plagiarism, an imitated thing. One thing has a name, another is looking for a name. And it's discovered that the name doesn't belong to the named, but to the designation. The leap into the identity of that name, which is legitimate because it's already legitimized. The leap into the illusion of a break, for it is an illusory break. It never ceases appearing as a fault line. Thank you. Thank you both. Now, what I would like to ask you, Robert, is um, about philosophy. What is it? Um, what is it that attracts you to philosophy? You have a philosophical degree in philosophy. You have allegedly written books of philosophical aphorisms. And uh, the piece that you and Martin just read clearly has a philosophical bent. Um, how do you reconcile philosophy and literature? How does it work for you? Well, for me, philosophy is uh, mostly the, the art of asking questions. And that's exactly what I like about philosophy. Um, okay, that, that's a concise, I did not expect a concise answer from a philosopher. It's <laughs> 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 ready to relax. <laughs> um, but let me put it to you this way. If, if, <laughs> if an owl is tagged as philosophical in this country, that would be a suicidal act on the part of the publisher. <laughs> So, um, because the storytelling is, you know, the great value in, in, in the world of American publishing. So how do you combine, uh, I mean, what, is, what are your techniques, what are your strategies to combine philosophy and literature? How do you write a novel that is philosophical? Well, <clears throat> it's very simple. I started with aphorisms, with writing aphorisms, and, and uh, then uh, I realized that uh, there are only only a few few people who who read aphorisms, <laughs> <laughs> and only few publishers who are interested in, in, book of Afori in uh, books of aphorisms. And so I, I decided that uh, I will try to write uh, write some novel. And finally, I I wrote two novellas. And um, what was interesting about it for me was that I could use. Uh, the style of, uh, of thinking and style of writing that I used before in my books of aphorisms, that I, I somehow uh, incorporated, incorporated uh, my aphoristic thinking into, into those novels very organically and, or I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> you, read, you read some fragments from my book, so... Yeah, I, I, I think so, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I picked it myself yes, for, the, for the anthology. Um, there is a place for it, certainly. And um, um, 
there's, there has been a dissociation of sensibilities where thinking in, in fiction has been um, diminished, let's say. Um, it's difficult to write, for people to write something that requires the reader to go back to the same paragraph more than once, never mind the same book. Um, the other question I want to ask you is, you told me in the green room, which is not green at all, <laughs> um, that you moved to Prague, your family moved to Prague just before the breakup of Czechoslovakia in 93. Um, and that it was a traumatic experience. Can you tell us a little more about that? Uh, it's true. Uh, it was connected uh, with the fact that my father was involved in, in politics after the so-called Velvet Revolution in 1989 in our country. And he was, uh, he was in fact uh, the head of, of the first political party after the first three elections after after the 40 years of, of communism in our country and uh, that was a very exciting time you know the time of the revolution and in 1989 and the beginning of 1990 and then suddenly um, Slovak nationalism started to grow and um, the situation started to be unbearable from for my father because he had some very serious uh, argue with, uh, with former Prime Minister Vladimir Mečiar and, and the consequences of that were that uh, we, have, we, we had to move, uh, our family had to move uh, from, from Slovakia. And, and we decided uh, to move to Prague because my father had some connections there uh, from the past and so and it, it happened in 1991. That's right. uh, so you write in Slovakian while living in Prague. Is that difficult? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not answering for, uh, for, 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 for your two questions. Well, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what is difficult about it? Yeah, obviously, um, you're exposed to the language that is in my ear at least, close to Slovakian, and you, in some, and you live in Czech, oh, whereas course. you have to write, well, write in Slovakia. It's difficult that it is not difficult. Uh, what is not difficult is to write uh, in Slovak, where, where when you are Slovak, which is my case, so it's not difficult to write in Slovak, but what is difficult is uh, to, be, to be read in Czech Republic when you write in Slovak. <laughs> because, because Czechs don't read Slovak. <laughs> they are only, only uh, Slovak writers. They, they are not interested in, in reading Slovak writers, even though they are uh, the closest neighbors of Slovaks, which is, uh, which is the fact. And uh, so when, when I write in, in Slovak, I have to publish my books uh, in Slovakia, <laughs> which I don't want. Right. So the result is that I decided to, to publish my, uh, my books in English. <laughs> yeah, it's a good solution. Um, do you but write of course, I write them in Slovak, but uh, and then they are translated into English. Right. Do you, of course. Uh, do you write in Czech at all? Uh, I'm, I'm able to write in Czech also, but uh, not this kind of writing. Right. I can write short uh, journalistic pieces and so on in, in Czech. But I worked uh, in Lidar, in Novini, uh, newspaper for a while, so I have this experience, but uh, this kind of writing is, each word is, is really important, and so my sensibility uh, is built on my, uh, my knowledge of Slovak. Thank you. We'll continue the conversation after everyone reads. It will be more general, I suppose. So our next read is Noel Rivas, who was born in the canton of Valais in Switzerland. She has written a number of short stories and two novels, Efina and With the Animals, uh, the uh, latter one, With the Animals, which was published in 2002, in fact, it's the earlier one, has been described, um, has been adapted for stage and screen and has been described as a story of a frustration of a frustrated peasant in an invented spoken language. I'll ask her about that. She teaches creative writing at the Swiss Literature Institute at Vienne, which is where she lives. She will read from um, 
the story that was published in this anthology called The Children of the Yes. I will read in French. Les facteurs amènent du courrier et au milieu une lettre de la directrice. Sur l'enveloppe, elle a écrit « Cette lettre vous sera donnée en dictée par le plus vieux d'entre vous. » Notre aînée déchiffre la lettre. « Mes enfants, » elle commence, « comment allez-vous, mes petits J'espère que vous vous sentez bien et que vous prenez le temps de vous divertir un peu à côté de l'étude. Je n'ose pas imaginer combien votre apparence a changé ni combien de centimètres il manque au bas de vos pantalons. » On aperçoit vos chevilles, c'est certainement laid. S'il vous plaît, ne retardez pas le moment de vous rendre dans un magasin, si vous en avez l'occasion. Je vous envoie des billets. Je pense sans cesse au repas que je pourrais vous faire cuire. J'ai mis de côté des recettes. Je serai un jour de retour pour choyer votre digestion et donner ce qui pourrait manquer à vos organismes. Mais je suis intimement sûre que vous pouvez vous suffire. Vous êtes heureusement nombreux. Que M. Morceau et moi-même soyons ou non à votre tête. Ça ne change au fond pas grand-chose. Vous ne manquez jamais de rien. Vous vous octroyez à vous-même ce qui vous est nécessaire. Peut-être ne sentez-vous même pas cette absence qui me crucifie. Oui, mes pauvres enfants, je suis déchiré de ne plus avoir ma couvée. Je suis en hiver sans manteau. Mon esprit a froid et grelotte. Je pense sans cesse au bonheur de vous réunir autour des tables. Il est bon de vous faire obéir, de vous tenir dans mes mains, de savoir que vous êtes à moi et que vous vivez sous mon aile. Vos pensées me sont ouvertes et vous me donnez toujours tout, d'un bloc tout ce que vous êtes, parce que vous êtes mes enfants et je suis votre directrice qui vous tient sous sa protection et qui ne vous lâchera plus, non, jamais, quoi qu'il advienne. And uh, they have told them that they will be back soon, but they're not coming back. The postman bring the mail, and in the middle is a letter from the headmistress. From the envelope, she has written, this letter will be read aloud by the oldest among you. And so our eldest deciphers the letter. My children, she begins, how are you, my little ones? I hope that you that you feel well and that you are taking the time to enjoy yourselves a little besides your studies i don't dare imagine how much your appearance has changed now nor how many centimeters of skin are now showing at the bottom of your trousers your ankles must be showing it's certainly ugly please don't delay going to a shop if you have the chance i'm sending you cash I'm thinking non-stop about the meals that you could make yourselves. I'm setting aside recipes for you, that one day I'll be back to indulge your digestive systems and give your bodies what they might be lacking. But I'm absolutely certain, that's the mistress calling, <laughs> but I'm absolutely certain that you can be self-sufficient. Thankfully, there are so many of you Whether or not Monsieur Morceau and myself are in charge of you doesn't really make much of a difference. You never want for anything, your budget for yourselves, what's necessary, perhaps you don't even feel this absence which is crucifying me. Yes, my poor children, I am in tatters because I no longer have my chicks. I am out in winter with no coat, my mind is cold and shivering. I think endlessly of the happiness of bringing you into the refectory It's good to make you obey, to hold you in my hands, to know that you are mine and that you live under my wing. Your thoughts are open to me and you'll always give me everything, all that you are, completely, because you are my children and I am your headmistress who keeps you under her protection, who will no longer let you go, no, never, no matter what happens. I insist so much on that because the times are difficult. You are still detained, and for the time being, I don't see any possibility of returning to join you again. While waiting, do keep sitting up straight in your chairs. Don't bring shame to those who gave their lives for yours. You aren't hunchbacks. You aren't rolled up like little snails. Don't forget your backbones. Hold yourselves up proudly. I send my thoughts to all of you, from the biggest to the least developed of you. I care about every hair on your heads. Note that I've intentionally employed a complex vocabulary 
in order that you can doubly profit from my letter. <laughs> Don't forget the postscript. More kisses than ever. Your sorry headmistress, Madame Morceau. Postscript. My children, you are the salt of the earth. You are the compost, the leaven. You are the divine goodness. Grow and multiply, and don't forget, before going to sleep at night, that Madame and Monsieur Morceau were your guides in childhood, your beloved headmaster, Monsieur Morceau. We know that we'll do what we have to. We still cry our eyes out, of course, but our noses are blown, and we'll soon be able to laugh without showing our glottis and tongue. At mealtimes, we force ourselves to stay until every dish is empty. We know that the head ma sorry, we know that the headmasters would like to see us at midday, all of us seated as we are, amid the tinkling of the dinner service, we never lick our knives. We swallow cauliflower and so on without fail, but my God, if only Monsieur Mousseau could come back soon to make conversation at the table. It's a dessert between us and we bore to death. And if Madame Mousseau could only come back to take come back too to take responsibility for the never-ending choices we have to make so we could have fun again, that she could decide for us where to go when we go out for a walk or in which place to take refuge when we get caught in a storm, which shirt it's better to wear, whether we should put on socks or not, if it's time for a bath, what time to set the alarm clock and how to grow up, how to react, what to think, what temptations to avoid and on what to model our lives. Well, the parts. I mean, there is, uh... um, I want to ask you about the situation of writing in French in Switzerland. It's a trilingual, in fact, quadrilingual country, right? There's Romanish too. Um, so you have your citizenship, but you also belong to a language that is larger than um, your citizenship. How do you reconcile those two aspects of your life as a writer? I think it's a very important point and very crucial point in my in my everyday life and in my um, decision to become a writer too. Because yes, I am writing in French, but the problem is that is it is not really. It is my language, and at the same time, it is the language of France, which is a foreign uh, country. And I think it was very difficult for me to find my identity as a writer, as a Swiss writer, in French. And this is my explanation why I choose to write so um, special book as a as a first novel. I choose I've chosen to write in a in a very strange and um, deconstructed language, uh, full of mistakes, very expressive, but at the same time, time full of mistakes and very um, different from the classical French. So it was not that you based your first novel on a dialect, on an existing dialect? No, so not at all. It no, it, it is not a dialogue. A dialect, <coughs> it is an invented uh, language. Nobody is speaking like that, I can assure you. <laughs> it was really um, a literary invention, really. And it was for me, at the same time, um, a literary um, exploration. And I think um, um, I was looking for my identity as a writer, I think. That suggests that even if you write in French, it's in some ways invented for your own purposes, and for your own particular position um, as a writer in French in Switzerland? Yes, I was not conscious of that, but now, uh, ten years later, I, I, I can't say yes, I was, I wanted to, to, to write in, like uh, the, the big writers, big French writers, and I was intending to do uh, so, so good as they, they were writing. But um, it was not right for me to, to write like that because I, I'm, I'm Swiss, I'm not French. And I was trying to find my, my place. Um, so your works are, are your works translated from French into German and Italian to be published in, in Switzerland? 
My first novel, yes. Only my, my first novel. And how was it received? Well. <laughs> but, you know, I was, I, was, I was lucky because it's not uh, automatically the case that a French-Swiss writer uh, becomes uh, translated into German. And there is a gap between uh, Swiss-French writers and German-Swiss writers. And we, we don't know each other. Because we, if we are not translated, we, we can't read uh, each other. Right. So the Swiss Literature Institute in Vienna, that's in the, in the Francophone part of the country. Yes. But does, does the institute, uh, are there German or Italian language writers working at the institute? And if there are classes and workshops, are they conducted in German or Italian? Both, both languages. It's a bilingual institute. And I'm teaching in French, but I have a lot of colleagues that are teaching in German. And sometimes there are um, <coughs> atelier workshops that are bilingual, yes. So you would have students who take workshops in all of those languages? and then Yes, to not always, but uh, often, yes. And how was your work received in France? It was well received, but it was um, it created a surprise, I think, because of this strange language uh, of my first novel, and um, people w were wondering uh, why I, I I have chosen to write uh, on this way, and they were also um, asking questions uh, like you, uh, is it a dialect? Uh, uh, are, uh, peop is, are people speaking like that in, in Switzerland? <laughs> <laughs> well, we now know that there are none. Um, but they might start speaking. You're all your readers in the other language and then have little book clubs in, you know, in the other language. That will be nice. Um, thank you. We'll talk more after everyone reads. Um, Patrick Boldhauser was born in Liechtenstein. He was born in Switzerland and um, St. Gallen, Switzerland, because it was across the border from Liechtenstein. And so he was born in Switzerland, but he spent his first 20 years in Liechtenstein. The Principality of Liechtenstein is, I think it's fair to say, small. It's about 40,000 people. Yeah. Um, and then he left and lived um, in Berlin, and now he lives in Zurich. Um, he has been involved with uh, theater and has uh, acted and has worked in theater as a, a, uh, a director and also has written a number of plays. Um, he, the, his plays have been performed in uh, German-speaking lands but also in Poland. Um, presently he lives in Zurich and has a five-month-old daughter so he can only write short stories at this time. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> philosophical aphorisms about life, <laughs> life and diapers. Um, he's going to read from the story in this anthology, which is called Tomorrow It Is It's Degendorf. Um, I will read in German, which is uh, quite a foreign language in a way, because uh, our my country, Liechtenstein, uh, just knows dialects. So. But I, I don't uh, write in dialect, I write, write in high term, which is quite a strange thing, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I will uh, read one part and then uh, um, Martin will read the translation and I will read another part, so it's, maybe it's more easier to follow and to keep following. Morgen in Deckendorf. Der Zug hält an und du steigst aus. Es bleibt dir gar nichts anderes übrig, Endstation. Dein Koffer ist schwer, in etwa so wie damals denkst du, als ich fortgegangen bin. Der Bahnhof hat sich seither kaum verändert, 25 Jahre ohne nennenswerten Wandel. Bei jedem Besuch das gleiche Bild, eine Kneipe für verlorene Seelen, ein Kiosk, der meist und so auch jetzt den Dienst am Reisenden verweigert, weil er sich nicht an die versprochenen Öffnungszeiten hält, und ein öffentliches Klo, wo noch die gleichen, wenn nicht gar dieselben, denkst du, Sprüche über den Pissoirs auf einstmals weißen Kacheln prangen. Another brick in the wall, zum Beispiel, I can get no satisfaction, oder der ultimative Klassiker des Latrinenhumors, jedenfalls bei den Männern, woraus sich auch gleich die Frage ergibt, was wohl bei den Frauen an der Wand geschrieben steht, doch mit Sicherheit nicht, schau nicht auf den Witz an der Wand, betrachte lieber den in deiner Hand. 
Tomorrow it's Degendorf. The train stops and you get off. Nothing else you can do, end of the line. Your suitcase is heavy. Sort of like back then, you think to yourself, when I went away. The station was hardly changed since those days. 25 years and nothing different worth talking about. Same scene every visit. A bar for lost souls, a kiosk that usually, like now, is of no help at all to passengers because it's never open during the hours it says it is. And a public john where the same, even if they're not the same, you think to yourself. The same pearls of wisdom are plastered on the, one, on the once white tiles over the urinals, such as another brick in the wall, or I can't get no satisfaction, or the ultimate and classic latrine humor, at least in the men's, which leads directly to the question, what's on the wall in the ladies? Not this gem for sure. <laughs> Don't look at the words that before you stand, behold the joke that's in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Dein Koffer ist nicht mehr derselbe und du fragst dich, wie viele Koffer habe ich wohl inzwischen verreist? Doch über deinem Auszug in die große, weite Welt, wie du dir nicht verkneifen kannst, an deinen Gedankenfaden anzuknüpfen, was deinen Mund zu einem leicht spöttischen Lächeln verleitet, das du aber nicht sehen kannst, weil über dem Waschbecken, in dem du Hände waschen stehst, wie damals schon und zwischenzeitlich ebenso verlässlich, kein Spiegel zur Betrachtung hängt, enthält alles Wesentliche, was du besitzt. Du gibst dich diesem Lächeln hin, nur für einen Moment, fühlst den Abgrund, der dahinter lauert, und machst dich auf den Weg. An einer Kurzvisite des Frauenklos, nicht etwa Voyeurismus, sondern, wie man neudeutsch sagen würde, Gender Studies im Sinn, vergleichende Latrinenlinguistik, wirst du gehindert von einem Kind, das dir entgegenrennt, um dich zu umarmen, was aber allerhöchstens halb gelingt auf Höhe deines Beckens, wobei du peinlich berührt entdecken musst, dass dein Hosenladen offen steht. Your suitcase isn't the same, and you ask yourself, how many suitcases have I ridden to death since then? But it's a suitcase that contains basically everything you own, just like when you first headed out into the big, wide world. You can't help letting your thoughts connect with what twists your mouth into a slight sneer, though that's something you can't see because there isn't any mirror, none over the sink you're washing your hands in, the same way you did back then, and the routine's been the same ever since. You give in to that sneering smile for a moment, feel the abyss lurking behind it, and go out. You pop into the ladies' john, not really voyeurism on your mind, but, as the current lingo puts it, gender studies, comparative <laughs> latrine <laughs> linguistics. <laughs> and you're blocked by a kid running at you to hug you, only half succeeding at hip level, and so you discover to your embarrassment that your fly is open. <laughs> Onkel, Onkel, wir holen dich ab mit dem neuen Auto. Du bist zu überrascht, um etwas zu sagen, handlungsunfähig auch. Keine zärtliche Geste, kein Streicheln über das rotblond lockige Kinderhaar und auch kein züchtiges Hochziehen des Reißverschlusses ist dir möglich. Regos, also stehst du da, Salzsäulen gleich, dann nimmt das Kind dich bei der Hand und weist dir den Weg zu deinem Bruder. Es ist das erste Mal, dass Robert dich vom Zug abholt und hat dich nicht auf diese Premiere vorbereitet. Folglich hast du ihm bei eurem letzten Telefongespräch auch nur die ungefähre Ankunftszeit des Busses verraten, der dich wie üblich vom Bahnhof zu ihm bringen sollte. Er musste also erst einmal doch schauen, welcher Zug zum Bus, mit dem du meintest, dass du kommen würdest, passt, was freilich kein Problem darstellt, dank Schnellzugang zum Weltweitnetz, aber doch ein Umweg, den du nicht von ihm erwartet hättest. Und jetzt steht also da, die Arme verschränkt mit einem schwer zu deutenden Ausdruck im Gesicht und du fragst dich, Entdecke ich eine Spur von brüderlichem Stolz darin? Ihr begrüßt euch so wie meist mit beiderseitigem Nicken des Kopfes, ganz als ging es nicht anders. Sind deine Hände noch vom Koffer und der Kinderhand blockiert und die Hände deines Bruders durch die verschränkten Arme nicht zum Schütteln zu haben? Auf deine Frage, womit du diese Ehre verdient habest, bekommst du keine Antwort. Stattdessen aber ein Hinweis darauf, dass dein Hosenladen offen steht. Uncle, uncle, we've come to pick you up in our new car. <coughs> You're too taken by surprise to say anything or do anything. No affectionate gesture, no stroking, no stroking the kid's curly reddish blonde hair. And you can't even pull your zipper up gracefully. So you just stand there, immobile, like a pillar of salt. Then the kid takes your hand and shows you the way to your brother. It's the first time Robert has picked you up at the station, and he hadn't prepared you for this premiere. And so the last time you talked to him on the phone, you'd only given him the bus's approximate time of arrival, the bus that, as usual, was to bring you from the train station. He must have gone ahead and figured out which train hooked up with the bus you said you'd take, which isn't a problem thanks to the web, 
but it was nevertheless a tricky move you would not have, have expected from him. And so now here he is, arms folded, and with an expression on his face that's hard to read, and you ask yourself, do I detect a trace of brotherly pride here? Your greeting is, as usual, a mutual nod of the head, as if there were no other way to do it, since of course your hands are occupied by your suitcase and the kid's hand, and your, by the suitcase and, your kid's, and the kid's hand, and your brother's hands aren't available because they're folded over his chest. You get no answer to your question, what have you done, what have, what have you done to deserve this honor? But instead you get a heads up that your flies open. <laughs> Über den Umfang deines Reisegepäcks, dem sehr wohl verdächtig erscheinen müsste, der große, schwere Koffer und die vollgestopfte Umhängetasche, obwohl du nur eine Nacht bei ihm verbringst, verliert er kein Wort. Vielleicht ist er ja froh darüber, denkst du, dass ich viel Gepäck dabei habe, schenkt dieser Umstand doch der Großräumigkeit des Kofferraums, den er dir mit einladender Geste öffnet, erst die rechte Relevanz und du weißt, jetzt musst du was zum Auto sagen. Groß, sagst du. Bequem fügst du an, nachdem du auf dem Beifahrersitz der schwarzen Leder Platz genommen hast und erstaunlich leise, als ihr schon eine Weile unterwegs seid. Und das stimmt sogar. Das Auto ist groß, bequem und leise, zumindest wenn man drin sitzt. Es gehört aber auch jener Kategorie von Fahrzeugen an, für deren Verbote vor nicht allzu langer Zeit mit der Unterzeichnung eines Volksbegehrens eingetreten bist. Ich habe es erst seit ein paar Tagen gesagt, dein Bruder weist auf eingebaute Extras hin. Sonderausstattung gibt es nur in den Staaten. Fühlst du die Kraft? fragt er und drückt den Fuß aufs Gaspedal. Ja, sagst du mit gespielter Freude, den Blick aufs Armaturenbrett geheftet, die Benzinanzeige im Visier, weil du der festen Überzeugung bist, dass der Vorrat an Treibstoff mit jeder Beschleunigung des Wagens um ein sichtbares Maß schwindet. Das Armaturenbrett ist aus rötlich braunem Holz gefertigt, Ebenso ein Teil der Türverkleidung und du hoffst, dass es wenigstens kein Mahagoni ist. He doesn't waste words on the extent of your luggage, which might well seem suspicious to him, the big heavy suitcase and the stuffed shoulder bag, though you're only spending one night at his place. Maybe he's happy, you think, that I've got a lot of luggage because it shows off the huge size of the, of the trunk that he opens with an inviting gesture. The first important thing to notice and you know you've got to say something about the car. Big, you say. Comfortable, you add, after sitting down in the black leather passenger seat, and amazingly quiet after you've been moving along for some time. And it's actually true, the car is big, comfortable, and quiet, at least when you're in it. But it also belongs to the class of vehicles you wanted banned not so long ago when you signed that petition for a referendum about it. <laughs> I've only had it a few days, your brother says, and points out the factory-built features. Special trim, only in the States. Feel that power, he asks, and push down on the gas pedal. Yes, you say, faking delight. Your eyes glued to the dash and fixed on the fuel gauge because you're firmly convinced that the gas supply will noticeably sink with every increase in speed. The dash is trimmed in reddish-brown wood, the same as part of the door uh, covering, and you hope, at least, it's not mahogany. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. <laughs> you told me before um, the event that your parents and your brother still live in Liechtenstein. Yes. Yeah, um, is this story about going back to Liechtenstein? If it's not, what is going back to Liechtenstein like for you? Uh, I mean, it is. Uh, it is about going back to Liechtenstein, but it's not autobiographic. It's not a true story, but uh, it can't. Be, uh, it could. It could be. So uh, it felt like that for years, but uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm grew older and uh, I'm more uh, more uh, uh, um, convenience with, uh, with uh, going back. There. It's not so much pressure on me if I do it, but it, it once was. So. So what is it when you go back to Liechtenstein? Do you see old friends? Do you? Um, yeah, yeah, sometimes and I visit my my, as you said, my, my family, my brother, his uh, wife and children, and my mother and my father somewhere. So I'm going back there twice a year or so not more. Um, you obviously read in uh, German, so it's a similar question to the one that I asked Noel. Yeah. Um, your experience is not exactly German. Having grown up in Liechtenstein, you live in Switzerland, and you write in German. So you are Liechtenstein 
Swiss writer who writes in German. How do you reconcile? <laughs> it gets even more complicated. <laughs> How do you reconcile the, the uh, belonging to the German language and then um, your local, as it were, loyalties? Uh, for me, it was in a way it was a big relief to to, to be able to 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 write in a in a you know a, a, so, a sort of artificial language because because high German is is for me it is an artificial language and uh, yeah it was like. Uh, like going away from Liechtenstein, like going in a, a much bigger context, which there are no such a lot of memories in it and, and stuff like that. So I, I felt quite free to go there. So that maybe that's why I, I did not have to invent a, a complete <laughs> new language for myself. So because it was like that in a way. So I suspect that people read you Liechtenstein. Did they read your work? What is the? How does it work? You know, how do they react? Not at all, in a way. I mean, some do, do but uh, people are quite uh, sit on their mouths there. They right. don't talk about it. Right. But they, they know me and they read me. I know it, but, uh, but I don't know what they're thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, but it's like uh, Harry Murlich once said, this famous uh, uh, author from the Netherlands, Harry Murlich. Uh, he once said, uh, in, Nether in the Netherlands, I'm world famous, so maybe I can say in Liechtenstein, I'm world famous. <laughs> um, I, this is, at this point, I want to expand it to all three um, authors, but I will ask Patrick first. Um, this project, uh, the, the anthology, and what I believe in, and the fact that these authors are here, it's all contingent upon the belief in the importance of translation in literature and then by extension in contemporary or any other life uh, because in my experience is uh, in my experience it is impossible to be a writer without having read some books in translation uh, I, I imagine that the, the authors who read only in their own native language that they would have proto-fascist uh, inclination <laughs> <laughs> so when you were coming up as a person as a thinking person and uh, becoming a writer what were you reading uh, in Liechtenstein or in, in Germany? Um, my first my first adult book I read was was uh, uh, Primal Punishment by Dostoevsky and it really shocked me. So it was a great experience. And I read a lot of different stuff because my mother used to, to work as a uh, what was it called? Buchhändler in a bookseller. Mm -hmm. So she had quite a, a, a nice library and I just picked out one of them. What are you reading these days? These days? Uh, I don't read much because my, of my daughter. So, uh. <laughs> 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 uh, and Noel, what has influenced you? Uh, I had a lot of big sisters. So I was reading the, the books of my big sisters. And I must say, I didn't make any difference uh, between uh, French books or translated books. I was not conscious of that. So I read, um, uh, yes, Russian writers, but also classic French writers and everything, yes. I, I had this chance, yes. Right. What are you reading these days? Um, in these days, I'm not reading. <laughs> <laughs> the, the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, because I'm very busy and I'm writing, and when I am writing, I'm not reading. It's like that. <laughs> yes, I, say, I have the same habit <laughs> that when I, I write, I cannot read. Me too. <laughs> but, uh, my, my favorite writers, uh, I have three. Uh, most favorite. Uh, novelists, uh, Dostoevsky, Kafka and Beckett. And then I read uh, some philosophers, you know, like Kierkegaard and Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and some French uh, philosophers and poets at the same time. Uh, and also I, I like Derrida, for example. I read a lot of books of Derrida in English translation. It's quite funny. <laughs> because there was no Czech and Slovak translations in that time. Um. Related to all this is the situation that all of you are at least bilingual, by necessity. You've grown up in situations which are, uh, even if Patrick, I don't know if you grew up bilingual, but your dialect in German are effectively two different languages in that they attach to different cultures. 
Um, Switzerland is, um, there are four official languages. And of course, you live in Prague and write in, in Slo uh, Slovak. So living in two languages, being bilingual by necessity, how does that influence you as a writer and as a person? So the type of thing. We can come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. No, no. Uh, now I'm living in a very little city uh, in Switzerland, which is bilingual between dialect and French. And I think it, it gives me um, a certain liberty. Yes, liberty, freedom. Because um, I can choose uh, in, in which way I want to, to be, which language I, I want to speak. And it, it, give, uh, it gives uh, a distance between what I'm, I am speaking and what I am writing. And it's, it's, it's interesting, yes, this distance uh, to, um, to have, to have this distance. I don't know if you understand me. No, I understand you perfectly. Um, yes, more ways than one. Uh, Robert? Well, uh, what I like about uh, big cities, and, and I think that today Prague is uh, in that sense big city too, what I like about big city is, the, is uh, uh, multiculturalism and, and uh, it's the, the opposite of monolingualism. And I think uh, in Prague you have a huge community of uh, English speaking and writing uh, writers. And uh, for example, and so. Uh, I was the co-owner of one, one small coffee house in the beginning of the 90s uh, in Prague and what was nice about our place was, was just that, that, that we, could, uh, we could read, uh, the writers could read in any languages and if someone did not understand that there are some translators and so on. I believe in translation, I believe that everything is, translate, tra is possible to translate into everything. And I think it's almost a philosophical idea, I really believe it. No, I understand. I agree. There's, um, and it comes up frequently in relation to this anthology, but also in relation to my work, because I'm bilingual. My native language is Bosnian. Um, uh, the question whether it could be translated, and both Bosnians and Americans, or people from other languages, they assume that some parts simply cannot be translated, that the jokes, for instance, cannot be translated. Well, as my position is that. Well, my position is, I quote both Robert Frost and Josef Brodsky. Robert Frost said poetry is what is lost in translation, and Josef Brodsky said poetry is what is gained in translation. <laughs> both of them are right. You lose some, you win some. But to abandon the idea of translation is to abandon communication uh, across languages. It's to abandon, in fact, the idea of a living language that is always influenced by all the other languages that it, inter it interacts with. Um, uh, so I agree with you in, in uh, more ways than one. Um, because this is a European fiction anthology, and in our anthology, Europe is understood in the widest possible way. It's not just European Union or just Western or Eastern Europe. We I think we include Turkey, too. Um, I need to, and I'm curious to hear, what is Europe for you? What does it mean to you? Do you see yourself as European? Do you, as European writers, do you live in Europe or do you live in um, your countries? Uh, and um, how do you interact with the idea of Europe? I'm you. It's a very special question to a Swiss writer because Switzerland uh, doesn't belong to Europe. <laughs> but it doesn't this anthology. Yes. <laughs> I just elected you to Europe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but um, I consider myself as a, a European writer because I'm traveling a lot in, in Europe. I need that. I'm, I'm living now in Berlin. Um, and I, yes, I'm constantly traveling from Switzerland to, another, uh, to other countries um, for, for my pleasure. Um, and I think I. I couldn't live only in Switzerland because I, I need this, this link with other countries. And what was the question? What is Europe? <laughs> <laughs> that was the question. What does Europe mean to you? How, how do you live in Europe as a writer? It's, it's um, 
a space where I, I can escape, I think, for, w away from Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time when people from Europe es escaped to Switzerland. <laughs> 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 it's changed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a little bit the same than, than for Noel because uh, Liechtenstein is not, not part of Europe either, so. Uh, <laughs> you know, it is now. <laughs> Yeah, they're, really too, they're really close to, to Switzerland, so you just do what, what they do. Um, and I'm living in Switzerland now, but I, I, I really feel part of Europe, and I think that uh, being a part of Europe is the only, the only way to, 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 to go to the future. So um, a united European country, uh, one country, it's, it's the only way to, to, to go on. <coughs> we have the same history, we have, we have the same need to our... Yeah, connected in so many ways. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid of each other. Makes sense to me. Robert? Well, uh, <coughs> when I was younger, I thought that I can live anywhere in the world. But then uh, I experienced, uh, I lived in Israel for almost two years, and, um, and I, in Israel I realized that, uh, that I'm, I'm European. Even though uh, my father is Jewish, and so I, I saw that, uh, that the Jewish identity is my main identity. I realized that no, no, I, I have to go back to, to Middle Europe. That's that's strange. But I can imagine to, to live uh, to live here also. <laughs> I can imagine in my head, but maybe in, reality, New York. in New York. I mean, in New York. But I what is nice about that. New York is also this multiculturalism <laughs> and what we are talking about before. And just something fantastic. And it's getting slowly to Prague also. It's much better now than it was 20 years ago, in that sense. You mean multiculturalism? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, now that we talked about it, I'm curious to hear what you think as American literature and then what you think of it. Um, <coughs> is there some sort of inherent opposition between European and American literature from your end? Why don't you start? What I think about American literature? Yeah, what, is, what do you think of when someone says American literature? What, is, what, is, what best represents American literature, contemporary or you know, um, of all time? Uh, and in relation to that, how do you see a difference and what is the difference between American and European literature? Well, <clears throat> of course, when I was younger, I read uh, Hemingway, for example, I read Faulkner and Bukowski and a few other writers and, and some poets like. Uh, Fellingetti and Ginsberg, and so on, and I s American literature was very popular uh, in um, in Slovakia under communism. And there were a lot of good Communist translations. <laughs> there were a lot of good translations and uh, of American writers. And, uh, what I can say about contemporary American literature, of course, I'm not an expert, but um, I'm. But I would not uh, divide uh, literature to the American or, or European literature because I know s because I don't think that <coughs> literature is really good. I don't think it's so important if it's written in Europe or in America. I know some contemporary writers like Joshua Cohen, for example, who is just excellent writer, and I think that this guy could, could live anywhere and he would just uh, stay great writer. And uh, the other, other writers, for example, published by the Dalky Archive Press, among other presses. Um, uh, for, uh, I like experimental fiction, and I think that in America you have much more experimental fiction than you have in Czech Republic. You cannot compare it. You have a lot of really great writers of experimental fiction living in America. So I don't know okay. what else to say. That's very good to hear. Thank you. Um, Patrick, um, I read a lot of a lot of American uh, authors like Hemingway or Steinbeck and, and so on, and uh, I, they influenced me, I guess, in a way. But I, I would also not uh, make a border between European and uh, American authors because a lot of American authors were immigrants too. So in a way, it is it is uh, connected, and uh, it doesn't matter. I think, but I don't know if there are specialties. Maybe you should ask. Uh, Something, uh, someone who's really studying that for and searching for the details. So, I don't know. 
I mean, there's, you know, if you tell someone that I just, I went to see an American movie as opposed to a European movie, there would be some preconceptions or conceptions that would be activated by that. It's a particular approach to story or narrative. Mm. Uh, and, you know, of course, there are uh, experimental and, um, and uh, less mainstream American movies, but as there are um, European movies that are spectacles and have a lot of explosions over this <laughs> Um, but in that sense, I, 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 I believe uh, personally that literature is this open field and you can enter it from any end uh, and that the distinctions are at best um, done for marketing reasons. However, the preconceptions are engaged and in many, many ways inescapable and with our um, anthology and the Dalky archive and their own um, uh, 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 practice they try to break up those distinctions to, to establish literature as a continuous uh, practice between writers. Um, but I have, would like to hear what Noel has to say about the American European literature question. I agree with you that literature is an open, open field. But I think we have a special interest uh, of what is um, happening in, in America. And um, it's, it's always interesting for us to see uh, if there is a, a big success in American literature to, to see what it is because we always think it comes from America, it must be new. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's true, uh, sometimes it, it, it is true and sometimes it is not. But we have this preconception. It must be new because it comes from, from the West. That's interesting. Um, thank you. I think at this point, I would like to open it for the audience who's ready already. <laughs> yes. What would you tell Americans to pay attention to in European fiction? <laughs> Somebody go first. Maybe you could start with this book because there is so many different countries in it, so many different stories, authors. It would be a good start, maybe. Yes, I'd like to ask you about writing the second person. How did, why did you choose to do that? Because I've, I've worked with that too. It's very interesting. It changes the whole feeling of the story for me. But what about you? Why did you choose to write in the second person? And do have you done it before? And will you do it again? Oh, I write in every person. Uh, just a switch it. I'm, switch, uh, I'm switching it a lot. The last, the last uh, short story I've written, I have uh, there. I have. Uh, one, uh, one part is in the, in the first person, one is in the second, one is in the third. I mixed it up. So uh, here, maybe because it's, it's, uh, it is not really autobiographic, but uh, it could be. So maybe that's why I choose that one, because it's not the first person, but it's the second. <coughs> in a way, it's, it's close, closer than the third. So uh, I don't like to pretend that it's not me. So. <laughs> I think it's interesting that um, the three of you think that American literature is experimental. And it seems to me that many of us here look to East Europe and the Mideast for experimentation. And, and I'm, I'm thinking of the cinema now, that the more interesting movies that are coming out are coming out from Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and, and East Europe, so I'd like you to comment on that. Somebody comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is, I have to concur that the, the, the notion of American literature as, as more experimental is strange because we're so here, we live here, um, we have this, um, we bristle against mainstreamness of, of much of you know, American fiction. Um, and so it's flattery to some extent. Mm -hmm. Since you brought it up, that you hear that uh, the, the best experimental fiction is in there. No, Since I you brought it up, talk about it. I said, I'm talking <laughs> about what I like. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about what I like. You know, I was not talking generally about American literature. You know? So is there a particular quality <laughs> to American experimental fiction that is not available in Europe or in, in yes, your language? Yes. <coughs> What are they? 
Who are they? What are they? What are the qualities of American exper experimental fiction or fiction that you particularly cherish? Um, <coughs> I have to think about it. Well, I don't know. And, uh, I think that. But at the same time, it should create some story. And uh, I cannot find too many books in, uh, written in this style in, in Czech Republic or in Slovakia. But when I googled it, I, I found uh, some, some American writers who are, doing, who, are, who are writing books in this style. And so I decided to, 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 to read some of them. Uh, I, I have a few books in, in Czech translation, I, uh, Czech translations, uh, which I can <coughs> somehow uh, stylistic, uh, from the point of view of style, uh, they are very close to what I want to do. And for example, but okay, but he's not American, he's English. Uh, <laughs> John, John Fowles, he, he wrote one book called Aristotle, and it's just uh, perfect. Uh, Dave Markson. <coughs> Markson, yes. And, is the author I, I googled actually, but I didn't read yet. So I, didn't. <laughs> I would like to read, but it's impossible to to get those books in, in our country. So I have to. Maybe I will go to the bookstore tomorrow and. <laughs> they would have to so there are no, no translations, and uh, I started to translate uh, some uh, prose poems. Uh, there is one uh, not very well known American uh, surrealist writer. Uh, whom I just translated a few pages uh, for um, a very famous Czech surrealist, surrealist, mag surrealistic magazine called Analogon. No, who's the writer? Uh, the, his name is uh, J. Karol Bogarte. He's uh, mostly a painter, as he's just writing from time to time. And, but I like, like this very dense style uh, which combines poetry, prose, and sometimes philosophy in one, <laughs> one sentence or in a few sentences. I just like this, uh, this, this style, slight style of writing. I don't know. I, I think what I like about American culture in general is the fact that uh, you don't have this, uh, this burden, burden of history, what we have in... Burden of history. Burden of history, what we have uh, in our part of the world. Or maybe you, it's not so visible, or I don't know. What do you say? I think there, there are different burdens. But maybe there are different burdens, yes. Yeah. I, I have a question for Noel. <coughs> uh, <coughs> from what I understand is uh, that you you created your own French language in, in a certain way. It's still understandable to, to the other French. Uh, but then uh, this has been translated into German and has been successful. So that, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, that really uh, poses a challenge in, in the translation. Uh, what, what has been done uh, when it was rendered in, in German? What kind of German was created in this process? Actually, it is transla translated into English too. And I think, yes, it is a challenge for a translator to translate such a text. And um, the, translat the translators had to find uh, their own voice. They had to, to, to study what I, I did with the French, and after that, uh, to try to do the same into their languages. Mm -hmm. But to, they had to take their freedom to, to, to follow the, the rhythm of the, of the English or of the, the German and to, to follow the, the music of the language because it was what I did in French. I, I chose to not to follow the grammar but to follow a, a certain rhythm, a certain music in my head and to, to transform the sentence uh, following this music. Okay, I just want to add that the book uh, With the Animals is, uh, it actually releases at the end of this month in English but we have copies um, here on the table outside. And uh, yeah, the language, the closest thing would be something like uh, Clapper Orange. I mean, that's sort of an invented, invented dialect kind of language. Cloud Atlas, two parts of Cloud Atlas. Mm -hmm. um, some of that again? Cloud Atlas, the day which was now, um, I mean, there are parts of it that are effectively 
invented language, but set in the future. It anticipates the evolution of the English language. Someone had a hand up there. Well, there's clearly an explosion of literary forms everywhere, and I think they're becoming more accessible. But when I think of American literature, I often think of it as more confessional, more personal, <coughs> and European literature more political. Would you like to comment on that? Is that how you would see it? Or confessional, that uh, confessional versus political. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is the case? That Europe, uh, American literature is more confessional and European more political? It would be good if it would not be like this, but I'm not so, I'm not so sure in contemporary. I mean, it, it depends on country to country. When Europe is quite huge and quite loaded, of course, but um, I mean, in Switzerland, or I don't think that there are lots of uh, political acting authors these days, and uh, it would need more, I guess, to, to, to maybe to make some changes or to make people think in other directions. But yeah, I mean, you can always uh, you can always use more authors uh, than there are. I guess. Uh, in the U.S., we hear today how hard it is for write, new writers to get their work accepted. How hard it is to get an agent. How hard it is to get a publisher. How many people are going to self-publishing and e-books? And could you talk about how it was for you? Um, uh, in terms of connections and all of those things. How it was for you to get published mm -hmm. in your respective environments. When you're starting out. Go ahead. Uh, it, uh, I think that uh, today in Czech Republic you have uh, plenty of different publishers and but of course when you are a young writer and not known not known writer, uh, it's not easy to get published, and you, you can you, you can get published also in, in very small uh, small publishing houses in very small editions. And the problem is not uh, to get published, but uh, to get some readership and also to get some money out of it. Of course, because you need some money, you need some in inca income as a writer. Uh, today. <laughs> People still think that uh, when you write poetry, for example, or experimental fiction, you are just doing doing it for fun. You know, just that it's not a real job. You know, and I disagree with this. It's hard work. <laughs> what was it like for you now to start? Yes, I I, I, I started with uh, short stories for the radio, and then I, I wrote this novel. Uh, did my first novel and uh, I was very lucky because I, I sent it, uh, I mailed it to a publishing house and I was published, so I, I, w I w was very lucky. <laughs> 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 um, and I think it is very difficult nowadays to, to, to be published. And I agree with uh, Robert. Robert, I think it is, um, people would think that uh, writing is not very serious and, and <coughs> we have to fight to to say to tell the contrary to, to, to show that it is a, a profession Patrick uh, yeah I'm in a situation that I'm still looking for a publishing house for my first novel <laughs> because uh, I have a publish publishing house for my plays but uh, I couldn't found until yet a uh, publishing house will publish my first novel so yeah, it is uh, quite hard because in Liechtenstein there is no publishing house, uh, no real one, so I don't want to let it publish there because it wouldn't be any good. And yeah, it is it is quite hard because there are a lot of people. Uh, yeah. In Europe, I think uh, um, the the publishing industry is far less dependent <coughs> on agents. There are fewer agents, um, and so there's it's easy to directly access publishers uh, and so to send them the uh, book out of the blue as it was not uncommon but it's changing it's changing yes um, but still compared to here it's not possible to uh, publish with uh, an agent as an editor do you ask um, writers for changes in their translation or is it just a direct i'm an editor only 
in that I choose the pieces and the dark work I press as uh, copy editors and, um, and um, translators, they provide for the translators. So the dark archive people work with, uh, with the authors and also edit the pieces. And are the right. editors fine about changes? Well, it's mostly um, the changes uh, that happen with these stories. Most mm -hmm. of these stories have already been published in Europe. And it, it's actually an interesting conversation, maybe much larger than we can have right now, mm -hmm. um, in terms of translation. When you're translating something, when you have a translated work, um, how much is the original fair game for edited right. mm -hmm. um, versus the translation for editing? Yes. And for a project like this, we will fall much more on, on the latter that you're editing the translation more than editing the original. When we're doing a book, um, we still fall a little bit more on the ladder as I think it does everybody else. There's this sort of feeling like it's already been edited and appeared in this form, so it would be wrong. The truth of the matter is that, that, that a lot of publishing houses in Europe don't edit at all, and so sometimes we do have to edit the actual text, which you then have to get back to the author with. Usually when you're editing a translation, you only have to talk to the translator. Right. Um, but sometimes, you know, there'll be, somebody will walk into a room and within two sentences, they're like halfway across the city and you don't know how they got there. Uh -huh. And so you have to figure that, those kind of things out. Yeah, so you, in that kind of case, you'll have to go back to the author. And I don't edit anymore, but I used to edit, uh, when I was editing French books, I would have to go back quite often because I don't think there's quite the aesthetic of editing text in France as there is in the US, at least that's my impression based on that the text that come in. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, especially for a project like this, you know, we accept them. This, one of the reasons this is such an enormous project for us is that in order for, for Sasha to be able to serve as the selecting editor for this, we actually have to get at least three to five stories from each country and have them all translated. Wow. Because, I mean, he's a, he's a multilingual guy, but he's not that multilingual. <laughs> and so, um, <clears throat> And so it's actually an enormous project because up, up front you have to have all these different stories translated and then he makes his selections based on that. Um, but there's a vetting that goes on ahead of time. You know, we work with different editors and, and, and people who make suggestions in other countries. And then we get these group, you know, these stories translated. Some of them are already translated. Um, and, then, um, and then the selections are made from that. And then the translations get copy um, But the translation, the, the stories don't get edited. The upside of the, of the project, just to add this, is that all the translated stories, they stay translated, so they're publishable as such. So the, the project generates translations, not just of the things yeah. in the book, but um, you know, all across the board. So for each published story, there are three or, piece, there are three or five unpublished ones, but in circulation, and they exist in English. And, uh, the dark archive people and I sometimes we try to place them in various publications. I was in Bratislava in uh, 1989. In 1989, very few people spoke English. Now it seems almost everybody speaks English. And I wondered what your experience was of the burden of English on your cultures and how it filters into the language. What, what is exactly the question? I, I'm not sure if I got the question. Again, the impact of the universalization of English on your culture and on your writing. Okay, I understand. <laughs> I think it does not have any impact to my writing. Because, uh, <laughs> because uh, I think I would like to... Uh, I think that every writer has his own... Uh, is it, is he is using his own language when he writes. That's my opinion. You don't have to agree with it. <laughs> and in that case, it doesn't matter if you read books in English or in French or in Slovak or in, or in Czech. It doesn't matter because you are transforming uh, everything <laughs> what influences you into your own language. <coughs> It does not have to be the language uh, by <laughs> which your books are written. It can be the mental language, mm -hmm. some kind of mental language. You know, last few years I almost I, I almost don't read any books because I just don't need it. 
I don't need to read. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a good place to say. <laughs> so, uh, does English or the dominance of English in global communication influence your writing or your respective cultures? Uh, I, I won't say so because I am. You, you hear that I have not many contacts with English. <laughs> I am more in contact with German area. And I don't think it has an influence on my work. I don't know, Patrick? I mean, it influences uh, the, 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 the everyday language in, in, in Germany and in Switzerland, of course. But, uh, but, uh, and if you, if you like, you can choose, you could choose to, to put it into your work too. But it, it, it is a decision. It's not something that, that just happens. So, uh, like like uh, like Robert said, yeah, every author creates his own language before he, he can he can start or she or she can start writing. And if you if you like English expressions, for for it, for example, or or create new English expressions that do not exist but but they have a special sound you, you you need for your work, you can do that. But it's always a decision. There's an upside of to the uh, universality of English because this is published in English, the anthology, then um, all the um, editors and publishers um, who can read English but live and work in other countries have access to some of these words. Mm -hmm. So that, um, for instance, and I'm very proud of this, um, uh, an excerpt from a novel by a Macedonian writer was read by people who read English all over the world, so his book was translated into 30 languages after wow. that, because they originally, they originally um, read it in English in this, in this anthology. So it's not always contamination of English. It does, in fact, to the extent that it is a lingua franca of, of uh, this time, it allows for access to many people. So in Norway, they can read Romanian writers because we published them in this anthology. We have time for one more question. Hey, um, one of the things that we're talking about in Dutch is I'm going to open it up and so many new authors that I've never gotten to read before. As Americans, we don't know, we tend not to know as much about European languages. But I'm thinking is, do you recognize many of the names in the anthology in your son? Do you recognize many of the names in the anthology? Are they familiar to you as your contemporaries <coughs> in Europe? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> It is a, a discovery for us too, I think, because we, because of the lack of translations, we, we don't know each other. And Patrick is coming from Liechtenstein, uh, nearly f from Switzerland, but I didn't know him before I, I came here. Wow. So Me neither. So we have, we have to meet in New York. So. <laughs> well, I'm glad we could help with that. <laughs> Forge friendships. Um, I think we have to end here. Thank you so very much for coming. Thank you for listening.